Our guest today was the center of attention in Kenneth Starr's 1994 media frenzied trial of President Clinton and the Whitewater investigation, Miss Susan McDougal. As a young lady, this small town, Washita Baptist College student, was swept off her feet by the flamboyant, worldly, and well-read campus professor, Mr. Jim McDougal. After a whirlwind courtship filled with impressive parties and introductions to important politicians and successful businessmen, Susan found herself married to, a, to Jim, a man much older than herself, who unknowingly to both of them at the time suffered from a mental illness that would later be diagnosed as bipolar disorder. In her book aptly titled The Girl That Wouldn't Talk, Susan tells her side of the story from the beginning of her life in Camden, Arkansas, to finding herself shackled and jailed in no less than seven prisons over a two-year period, a cruel tactic known as diesel therapy by the prosecution. This is a disheartening story, an eye-opener into the abuse of judicial power, fake media, and corrupt politics. But it is also a story of how one woman took a stand to speak no more and unexpectedly took her life back. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the table and microphone the strong, courageous, well-read, and a once too naive young lady, the notable Miss Susan McDougal. I think we're done. I think that's all we need to know. <laughs> I myself am impressed. Uh, that really and, is you. And the marriage sounds so much more fun than it actually was at the time. Um, Jim was 14 years older than me, so that's really not that much older. He just looked old. That's um, pretty much old. That's pretty old. How it? old were you? I was... 18, uh, 19? Uh, 22. I I'd graduated from college. But not when you met him and started dating not when him. I'm, no, no, not when I met him. But it was the year before, and he always had a trip to Washington, and the seniors went, and that's where I met him, and then I married him after college. And So you're 20, and he's 15 years older. That's almost twice your age. If you look at it like that. He was old. I get it. I, I'm totally on your side now. It mm-hmm. was. He was yeah. old. Yeah. You're nice. You're always nice. He so. was funny, though. He was really funny. And that went a long way toward bridging the gap in the ages. He talked like you were reading the greatest book in the world. His Just talking with him every day was hilarious and funny. I never saw anyone who didn't love talking to him because he was a uh, a guy who leaned into the story with you and had all the facts and all of the color and he knew everything pretty much to a 22 year old girl from Camden, Arkansas. It really was astonishing. You were born in Camden, Arkansas. Tell us about your mother and father and how they met. I was not. My father was in the U.S. military and he met my mother during the Second World War in a bomb shelter when the Nazis were trying to kill everyone in Europe. My mother was very impressed with the tall, six-foot-two, blonde, blue-eyed, handsome guy from Arkansas, and went and she took him home and fed him, and that was the end of that story. Or the beginning of that story. Yeah, that was the end of the meeting, but the beginning of life. And I was born in Heidelberg, seven brothers and sisters, and they were married all over Europe where my dad was stationed. So we had quite a life growing up. And we all felt like we were in the Army. Every time my dad got, you know, papers to move, we all packed our little bags and went wherever he went. So we were an Army family. We were a military family, all for one and one for all. Stand up for your country. How old were you when you got to Salute Camden? Salute the flag. Thank you. Say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. No, America the Beautiful. We were a very military family growing up. and that You gave speeches a, at the American Legion, didn't you? I won an award from the American Legion and a scholarship because we were true believers. My mother was Belgian, and my mother saw what the Nazis were doing to Europe, and the only thing that stopped them were the American troops that came to her hometown, and she thought, this is a country that comes where they know no one and saves people's lives. She thought it was the greatest country ever she couldn't wait to move here and to be american and, and she, she raised all of us and then she way. ends up in camden i bet she was a little shocked she was <laughs> she was she yes she was from a huge uh university city in belgium and had gone to school to be a doctor when the nazis closed the the schools to um anyone who so camden doesn't have an air force base why camden um i uh, my dad was 
Oh, that's his family from there. there. Oh, yes, gotcha. from around there. Mm-hmm. So why did you decide to go to OBU, Washita Baptist University? I think it was because I didn't decide. My parents wanted me to be close. I was a, our family's very tight knit, and um, they did not want me to leave. In fact, the first weekend I went to Washita, I went back home, and everyone was lined up <clears throat> in the driveway waiting for me. And I got out of the car, and my dad said, "You don't have to go back." And I was thinking, "Well, good, because I miss all you all." My mother said, oh, yeah, yeah. "She has to go back." Yeah, we were just very close. Um, so you're at OBU. You're studying what? Um, Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> I was the way I met Jimmy Dougal was taking political science courses. He was um, head of the political science department at Washita, and I took some political science courses. I was interested in that. Was that your major? No, it wasn't. Uh, speech was my major. Oh. Uh, and then, uh, how did he ask you out? How did you first end up going out with him? Um, I locked his office door. I was, I was doing some work for another uh, professor in there. And by accident, I locked his door and he kicked the door down. And I thought, this is a guy I need to know. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Looking back on it, that was the beginning of, of my, sh- I should have run. But actually, I thought, this guy kicked this huge wooden door down because it was locked and we could have gotten a key. But I thought it was rather chivalrous. I was outside the cool. office, needed to get in. I know. Yeah, I love the faces so you I've, two were making. Why speak, weren't you there at the time? Where say, were you? Speaks to your, I feel like your naivety. Your, yeah, like, oh, this guy's cool. He's kicking down doors. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's scrawny. He doesn't look like he could kick down doors, does he? Uh, he wasn't scrawny. He wasn't. He, he wasn't. I mm-hmm. remember. He was tall and thin, uh, but he wasn't scrawny. He mm. was pretty, pretty macho guy. So what was the courtship like? Um, listening to him talk, just listening to him and, and meeting a bunch of his friends. <clears throat> he'd worked for Senator Fulbright, and he knew most of the, he'd worked on the Hill for uh, Senator McClelland. Um, you and know, you met was, Claudia and Bob Riley. Through him. Is that correct? That's right. They were his closest friends, I would say, because when Bob became governor for that short period of time, when Senator Pryor, was it Pryor that went to Washington and there was a a wait for the election, he had been appointed. And Bob was uh, in the governor's office and Jim helped him run it. And uh, Bob Riley was a lieutenant governor at the time? That's right. And And became governor. And became governor. Mm -hmm. And Jim helped him run that. Did y'all move? Were you married at that time? No. That was long before. And you met Bill and Hillary Clinton during that time? Well, yes. Because um, they were at parties you went to. Bill Clinton had worked for Fulbright. Jim had gotten him the job. They were like, uh, Bill looked up to Jim. He had worked for Fulbright forever, and that was a pretty prestigious appointment at the time. And um, he loved Bill Clinton, just loved him, thought he was funny and smart and a great uh, person to know in Arkansas in upcoming politics. You know, he was going to be great. And was, Jim could see that. What was Bill's position at the time? He wasn't governor. No, he was He was a kid driving Fulbright around in an election when Jim met him. That was his first job, was driving Fulbright around and losing the car. He was always <laughs> losing the car. And Fulbright was furious. He said, who is this you've hired to drive me around? He never knows where he's parked the car. And so that was the beginning of the funny stories about Bill Clinton working for Fulbright and Jim being, you know, his boss. And And didn't Bill Clinton talk Fulbright's ear off and he one time said something like, don't ever let that kid drive me around anymore? That's in the book, I think, yes. Yeah, I'm like, I can just hear Bill Clinton talking somebody's ear off. Yeah, and thinking they want to hear it, you know. Uh, Never being shy about talking anybody's ear off. Yes, I'm sure they want to hear from me would have been the attitude yeah and uh i remember in the book you mentioned meeting jim guy tucker who was at the time breathtakingly handsome true he had there were posters in my dorm i was still in school there were posters in my dorm of jim guy because he was what was he at that time attorney general and girl said posters of him in your in your dorm room like a model yeah like a big like maybe vote for Jim Guy Tucker, this huge posters in their room. Oh, my he, gosh. He was startlingly good. 
startlingly. And I nice. Uh-huh. And well-spoken and well-educated. I mean, this is not someone you just bump into on the streets. Ernie Dumas called him a swashbuckler because he was a Marine and he... Well, he wasn't he the one that sailed on a freight ship across the Pacific? During the Vietnam War yeah, because just he... just because he wanted to go take pictures. Yeah, yeah. and he <laughs> uh, infiltrated the prison to find out what was the problem mm-hmm. with the prisons. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he was, a, he was very... Swashbuckler. Swashbuckler, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, your wedding day. Tell us about your wedding day. So Jim's kind of, you haven't really said yes, so to speak, to Jim about the wedding. He's just kind of railroaded you into this wedding. Yeah, I'd say that's probably true. I think that's probably true. I, it was like I didn't have a plan. And he had a plan. And I thought, well, I can do this for a while. And so that was kind of the thinking at the time. It was the 70s. Let's not forget. It's not today. And um, we got married to a little house that he had bought out in the country that was once a goat house, and he had redone it with all kinds of crazy wallpaper and things. It was funny. When you walked in, you had to laugh because Jim had done the decorating himself. Oh, I'd be furious. Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. He was living there. I, I, I wasn't living there, and I didn't care. I mean, oh. I, no, this is a goat house. This is not a house you really get your emotions involved in. Oh, okay. Um, and I, the story, I think, is in the book where I'm lying, lying on, the, on the rug, the new carpet in the house, and the, the whatever is, gets on goats is crawling. Across. Fleas? No, uh, legs and things like that. Spiders? Ticks, something Ticks. like that, yeah. And you could just see them. I mean, it's not like he had the place fumigated or anything. He just laid very expensive, lovely carpet and had the thing painted and... And on top of the dirt floor? I don't know. I didn't ask those questions. I'm just saying it wasn't yeah. well done. <laughs> I'll say. And, and it was frightening. And it had, the only heat in the house was a, a pot-bellied stove that had a pipe like Lincoln must have lived with. And there was no stove or anything in the kitchen that, and, and no microwave. There was, I don't even think microwaves were made yet. There was just cabinets and a refrigerator. What a paradox. And, yeah, we had Fulbright there once. We we had him to lunch. and uh, In the goat house? Yes, and Mrs. Fulbright said, I don't believe I've ever seen a kitchen that didn't have a stove in it. <laughs> <laughs> Jim didn't care. I mean, really, that sort of uh, accoutrement, that sort of, you know, dressing things up, it is what it is. Come see us. Yeah, we had Bill Clinton stay there one night. It was just what it was, you know. It's like camping out almost. So you got married. No, it had nice furniture. It had very expensive, nice furniture in the goat house. Goat house, yes. So you got married in the front yard of the goat house. That's true. Tell us about that. And I bet a lot of people came to that. No, not really. Oh. Uh, Bill Clinton came. Bob and Claudia came. Bob uh, married us. You know, he was blind, so he didn't have anything to read from, and he just kept saying the same thing over and over again. Do you do you take this person? Do you take this person? Do you? Do? And I thought, my. God, we're going to be here all day. He, he didn't know the lines, evidently. It was very funny. And what else? Um, it was raining. No, I don't think it was raining. You were barefoot. I was barefoot. But it was the 70s. I had flowers in my hair. I had a long 70s dress. I think in the book you said it had been raining and there was mud. Oh, there had been raining, yes. Yes. And the little flowers that had been planted and put out and everything, they were gone. They were in the mud. Yes, it looked like a mud track. So, but it, it was what it was. It yeah. wasn't like either of us said, oh, oh my de- God, we, we have to reboot. Yeah, it's you're, like everyone's coming. You're not putting on airs, that's for sure. No, that would not be something we ever really did. Which Or is, do. Yes. What is Jim's business when you met him? That really would have been, um, I think, what the worst thing that Jim would have seen in someone is that they were putting on. He didn't like that. Yeah, Fulbright didn't do that. I mean, Fulbright would buy a peach in the grocery store and complain about how much it cost. <laughs> it's a multi-billionaire. I mean, no heirs. Yeah. You know? Everybody's so pretentious these days, it we, seems like. We had bought this bank downtown, and we really spent a lot of money making it cool inside. And he had an office that was upstairs that was just really beautiful and soft, and he wouldn't go up there. He, I could not get him in his office. 
when I finally got him in there, Bill Clinton came from running one day and got sweat on his leather chairs in there. He said, this is why we don't need these things. We just need to, you know, stay in the basics. Look at the sweat on the chairs. (laughs) The things you remember. I think you have to laugh. I think you have to laugh. Oh, it's hilarious. You Uh, have to. Yeah. And he was funny. Mm -hmm. And he thought he was funny. And everyone thought he was funny. What was Jim's business? Real estate? He was good at it too, wasn't he? When you married him, was it real estate? Yes. He was mostly, you know, working in politics, local politics. Um, If you go to the polls, remember voice and make him your choice. Arkansas's own Sam Boyce. Do you remember him? You ran for governor? No. Oh, great guy. Great Democrat. His son is now uh, like a, a AG somewhere. I mean, big legal family. Great friends of Bob and Claudia, and Jim started working in local elections. And so did Jim didn't write jingles, though. No, I just remember that because I was a kid. I like that song. Mm-hmm. I have some political jingles stuck in my head that will never leave, too. Yes. Pin a rose on me, pin a rose on me, I'm for Roseman. You remember that one? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Oh. All right. So uh, Jim is a successful in po- local politics, but he dabbles in real estate. Yeah, he uh, kept uh, Faubus out of being nominated for the Democratic nomination once before he actually was made governor. I mean, he was active in making happen what he and others thought was good for Arkansas. And he was very... I would say in the middle of it all. And idealistic. It was the oh 70s, like you said. So idealistic. Yes. Um, he, he, he loved Adlai Stevenson. I mean, he could quote speeches from Adlai Stevenson. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you are going to Fayetteville to look at some property that he's thinking about buying. And you go through a little town and you see and you to have lunch. And there's a bank there, the Bank of Kingston. And it's for sale. Yes. What happens? What does Jim do? This is, this is, this is, this, I really need the the crown for this is your life. That's what this feels like. (laughs) This is like horrors. Yes, I do remember. I recall that. Um, What do they say in grand juries? I I don't recall that. Um, But he buys that bank. Yeah, he bought that bank. Not just anybody can buy a bank. Or did he get a partner? Uh, yeah, Steve Smith in Bill Clinton's office was his partner in that. They were both working in the governor's office. So who's the governor at this time? Bill Clinton. Oh, so this is years later. Bill, he's been a, uh, Jim's been successful in his real estate deals for several years. He's now, uh, he's now working in the governor's office with Steve. You said, and he's but but you're still but he's still dabbling in real estate. So he drives up to Fayetteville to look at some real estate. And sees this bank for sale. Calls Steve. Steve says, sure, I'll buy a bank with you. Well, Jim was the kind of person that was always looking for something to do, to buy, to resell, to make into something else. It was a passion. And <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, he was always looking for something to re- reconfigure. And this little bank was adorable. It really was. It was, it had a big ball safe in the window of the bank back in the old days if some if fire or something broke out and all the money and the stuff was in the big ball it the bottom would melt it had a little melty bottom and it would roll off the window and down the street now say that again okay it's a ball it's, it's huge the, it's it's as big as, room, as that right? door. Okay. Oh, it's no, as big as a regular door. Uh, it's six, seven round, feet. Though. It's seven big feet as that round. wall. It's big as that wall right there. And you look in the window, and there it is. And it's black, and it's gold-lettered. Bank of Kingston with a little gold handle thing. And it's on a plateau-looking thing, stand, that is supposed to melt in case of fire. And it's in the window so that it rolls out of the bank and is saved. We just thought that was the coolest thing ever. I still think that's the coolest thing ever. (laughs) I've never heard of anything like that. So it's on a wax base, I guess. Some kind of base that melts before the safe does. Okay, what do y'all do with it? Leave it at the window? Uh, uh, Of course. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. 
And we found um, at the they had taken a, a chainsaw and sawed off the teller's windows, you know, and they were like the ones down in the post office here in downtown Little Rock. They were those brass, beautiful. Mm. Do you know what I'm mm-hmm. talking? Mm-hmm. And he had them put back up, and it was you found them in the basement or it, somewhere it, uh, the, uh, it, in the back of the bank. Uh-huh. Yes, and. The, it had one phone when we bought it. It was on the wall. And anyone who used the phone went over to the wall and said, Bank of Kingston. So we had all new phones and all computers put in. It was fun. That it sounds like a was blast. was bringing it into the 21st century. And it was really fun. And the guy who ran it, Gary Bunch, was like, I mean, just the coolest guy ever. I wow. mean, you just couldn't meet anyone. Um, he rodeoed. He rode bulls. He was good looking he was funny he was macho he was he knew everyone in madison county he knew everyone who had money at the bank and everyone trusted him he was from an old old family was he smart too i guess oh yeah he was yes everything he was just perfect did whitewater go after him too please tell me no then I don't think so. I think they went through everybody. You know, you asked me if he was intelligent. I think he was intelligent and just stayed out of all of that. He wasn't in politics, and he wasn't in any of those things. Yeah, but Whitewater, when they went, when they came to town, they didn't care if you were in politics or not. They went after everybody. It seemed like that even barely knew you. They were like, "Well, we're just going to go," or or Bill Clinton, or any of y'all. Yeah, he ruined a lot of lives. In the trial that 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 I had, um, people got on the stand and wept and sobbed oh. over the fact they'd lost everything they had trying to, defend themselves, trying to defend themselves and then not convicted of anything yes just charged and then your life ruined and nothing came of it and it was i think a tactic to make people lie and it absolutely was yes if you like this video subscribe to our youtube channel by clicking on the picture of carrie's face in the center of the screen for more of carrie's interviews click either video on the right of the screen and as always thank you for watching